It's been three months with the Cavium Thunder X2. Can you hear that? Can you hear the echo? Thunder, thunder, thunder. <laughs> it's that, it's that chassis. It's the Cavium Thunder X2. That's a gigabyte chassis, that's the T91. It's a two U chassis, it's got 24, two and a half inch base. I did a full review on that and a bunch of benchmarks, but we need to talk about alternative operating systems because two important things happened the past few weeks. One, a lot of patches and updates have been made to both the platform and FreeBSD. So there's full FreeBSD support, basically. Now it's not a tier one support yet. FreeBSD is like tier one, you've got i386 and AMD x64. Tier two is, you know, maybe not as well supported, but FreeBSD is pretty much working on the Thunder X2 platform. But this video is more about SUSE Linux and everything in the Linux ecosystem and my experiences with Red Hat. So we gotta talk a little bit about everything. SUSE, so SUSE Linux Enterprise 15, full support for ARM and ARM platforms. So you can get your subscriptions. SUSE is also updating the subscription model. So you can still do the one, two socket subscription model and get a pretty good value. But it's also uh, per core, if it's less than like 16 cores per socket or something like that. So you get licenses in groups of four. So if you get like a 10 core ARM, you end up getting a license for like 12 cores. It's kind of weird. I think that uh, SUSE is kind of transitioning from the per socket model to the per, per core model. Now this chassis, this 2U chassis, is a dual socket configuration. I mean, I've got 224 threads because it's four threads per core. And I've been using it on Linux with a mixed workload, PostgreSQL, web services, mainly stuff like that. And I've been mainly using Red Hat. Now Red Hat, I think is still the best full support. I spent all day going through installers for SUSE and Red Hat and Debian and other ARCH64 installations. Strangely, there's more support, well, maybe not strangely, but there's more support for the ARCH64 on like the Raspberry Pi side of things than the Cavium thing. So I think Cavium's gonna need to get their, their rear in gear and connect more with the community. And hey, if you wanna reach out, level one, we get you plugged into some developers and some projects and provide remote access to chassis like this for developers to experiment and do stuff with and you know i don't know all sorts of insanity now zfs zfs was one of the things i wanted to test drive and it's almost there it's not quite there at least as a first class citizen with freebsd because freebsd 13 i think is what you're going to need in order to do this there's a lot of patches that have come from the you know from the community and cavium's been working on platform support gigabytes had some firmware updates that are sort of trickling down from more on the cavium side of things for better uh, support for what's going on inside of freebsd and that sort of thing but the uh, momentum that i'm seeing for this platform over the last year is honestly it's a little bit shocking so normally with like a platform like this, there's not as much uh, community support out the gate, or at least not, you know, it takes years. And so like in the beginning, when, you know, I was growing up with Linux, it was like x86, and then there was like the DEC Alpha. That was like the risk machine. It was like super amazing. And so like the DEC Alpha, it was like, oh man, I would love to have a system like that at home. And now that sort of the roles have reversed, Intel and, and AMD, are the leaders in like speed and performance and all this kind of stuff. And it's the reduced instruction set uh, competitors that are sort of bringing up the rear. This is a second generation platform and I can say that it is able to saturate 10 gig ethernet. It is able to saturate PCI Express by 16 disk controllers. It's able to saturate very high speed NVMe devices. The CPUs are not a bottleneck. Now, their x86 and AMD64 counterparts are faster in terms of like number of computations per unit time, but the cost here is much lower and the cost per unit compute is lower. Power usage, it depends on what you're doing, but generally it seems like power usage is also a little bit lower than competing platforms. Now that may change with the advent of seven and 10 nanometers, that's gonna happen in 2019. But if this platform continues with the momentum that it's had, especially with the support that we're seeing from enterprise vendors other than Red Hat, I mean, Red Hat, I guess what I'm getting at is 
if it's just Red Hat that's providing enterprise support, I'd be a little worried, but we've also seen SUSE come out and provide full enterprise support for the ARM platform, and we're seeing an honest concerted effort inside of the BSD community to provide much better support for this platform as well. So I think it's an exciting time if you're looking for x86 alternative platforms. Now that said, it is a little bit of an uphill battle. I mean, x86 and its, you know, flavors are basically at the top of the hill. So anything for these guys is gonna be an uphill battle. But in the enterprise sector, cost. Cost is what wins. And also a little bit of ease and simplicity. So I think three months in, my experience is basically community outreach is really the thing that's needed at this point. It's not really the technology. I mean, the second gen technology, compiler support, they've got all that in place, but now they need documentation, how to's, and success stories, like really step-by-step -step success stories. So to that end, I've started a few articles in the level one forums. We've got how to install FreeBSD on the Cavium Thunder X2, how I got up and running with Red Hat because it's got an IPMI interface and you, you can just basically load an ISO, boot off the ISO, and the IPMI interface, honestly, even for installing Red Hat, is a better experience than local USB sticks or anything like that, except for FreeBSD, because FreeBSD has those MEM stick images, so ISO is just, not happening on ARCH64. Now maybe they should include that in the build script, knowing that servers that incorporate the Thunder X2 generally are gonna have IPMI, and the IPMI is gonna have a CD DVD emulation capability. Maybe they should go ahead and spin ISO so that it can use it with IPMI. I think that's a good idea. But I used MemStick stuff, and MemStick stuff was basically okay, except Windows, using a bunch of programs on Windows to try to etch the USB to make sure that would work, did not actually work. So I'm glad that I spent time to actually check that. Now DD in Linux, of course, is totally fine. Although you may want to run Gdisk after it does it so that it can uh, move the protective MBR to be sized appropriately for whatever your USB stick is. If that sounds like I'm speaking some kind of crazy foreign moon language, uh, just go to the level one forum. It's just step by step. It's not really super hard. I am super excited about the future of ARM in 2019. I want to look back, I want to do another video maybe toward the end of 2019 and say, hey, alternative platforms, what are we looking at? How's ARM doing at the end of 2019? Because I really think that 2019 is the year of the ARM server. I don't know. Depends on Cavium. Volume, outreach, price point. That's really what's going to matter for this platform, I think. And so I think that Liz Torvalds is right when he says that developers want to be able to just take whatever they're running at home and then be able to run it in the cloud. They don't want to have to think about the platform or, or little differences with the platform. I mean, certainly just installing is more of an uphill battle than, say, on an Epic server or, you know, a Xeon server or something like that. And that's just, you know, because it's a chicken and egg, a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. I think, I think you probably get that. So the thing that's different now that I think wasn't true then is that emulation is more accessible to everybody and decently fast emulation. So if there's some compelling reason to move to the platform, there's less friction now than there was 20 years ago. And that may play a factor. So if there's a really compelling reason to move to another platform like openness or cost or something like that, you may see people move over to this. Now, it's probably true that you're still gonna have x86 at the super high end. It's really hard to dethrone, you know, their, x86 is leading in process, it's leading in a whole bunch of other things. But we've also got companies like Cavium that are really pushing the envelope in terms of like what ARM is capable of. And remember, the x86 machines that supplanted the RISC machines were not as good as the RISC machines, they were just more accessible. So it's really that accessibility equation that makes sense here. I agree a lot with what Lance Torvalds is saying, but I think that his historical reference for that, things are a little different now than they were when, you know, the deck alpha was king or, or whatever. Was the deck alpha ever king? I mean, there's gonna be, like I've just, I've just triggered somebody. It's fine. I'll see you in the forum at level one. I'm Wendell, I'm signing out, and that's where I'll be. Boiler snakes on MIPS still, so.